So, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the third event of this year, 2016 West Australian ECU Lecture Series. And our event this afternoon features Professor Beth Armstrong. And Beth will be speaking on the topic, Lost for Words. And she's going to examine how language is organised in the brain and what happens when language is affected by brain damage after, for example, a stroke or traumatic brain injury. And she'll also discuss the latest advancements in rehabilitation to help people regain not only their language, if you think about it, not only their language skills, but actually to help them retain their very identity. Now, each month, well, those of you who are regular know this, the West Australian ECU Lecture Series provides a forum for an ECU professor to discuss a pressing issue facing our community, to outline their research in the area and to engage in discussion with colleagues and the public. Because until research is published, until it's out there, until you talk about it, it doesn't exist. And it is the job of a professor to do what, Arshad? Correct. It's the job of a professor to profess. And that's what Beth's going to do this evening. Now, we're very proud to partner with the West Australian in what I think is an exciting series and in its second year now. So just a little bit more about Beth. Now, Professor Beth Armstrong is Foundation Chair in Speech Pathology at ECU, and along with a speech pathology team, which was recruited to ECU in 2009, Beth has established a fully accredited undergraduate speech pathology program and a postgraduate research program. Now, prior to coming to ECU, she worked at Macquarie University, where she established the first speech pathology master's program in New South Wales. Beth worked in the hospital sector as a clinician in Sydney for many years before taking up an academic career, focusing on acute inpatient care, as well as longer-term rehabilitation for people with communication disorders, for example, after a stroke. So I think it's going to be a fascinating lecture. Of course, we'll be able to ask questions afterwards. So without any further ado, let me welcome Professor Beth Armstrong to the lectern. Beth. Thanks, Steve. I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners, the Noongar people, before commencing this talk, this talk and also um, elders past and present. OK, so what I'm going to be talking about tonight is something that we all do a lot of, that we're all experts in, and that's talking. And we talk through language, which is the focus of the talk tonight. And language is something that some people in this room are even more expert about. People, I'm sure there are people who are bilingual, people who are trilingual. Um, interesting statistic is that the average person in the world isn't monolingual. The average person in the world today is bilingual and trilingual. So there are lots of experts, I'm sure, here in the room about language that are experts in language um, and really bring a lot to the discussion already. Now, one thing about language is by the age of four, a child has mastered pretty much what you need to master. And as we know, Children are able to learn any kind of language. We start off as a blank slate, and we're all able to learn very quickly any language that we're exposed to as a child, what our first language is. Language does continue to um, develop right up till adolescence, so that you develop more complex skills like writing essays, coming to the university, um, you're reading more complex books. But for those of us who are kind of maybe a little bit concerned about ageing, one thing that doesn't get worse over age is your vocabulary. It actually grows. So as your life experience grows, your vocabulary grows. You may get slower at remembering the words, but you've got more of them. So that's, that's you know, a positive thing I thought we could start on. So what um, I'm going to focus on tonight is what happens when we lose that very important skill of language through something like a stroke or a brain injury. A brain injury can occur after something like a car accident, a hit on the head, a blow to the head, a fall, all things that can happen to you instantaneously. And the condition that results from that when you lose your language is called aphasia. Aphasia. A meaning without and phasia meaning words. 
And I'm going to talk tonight about rehabilitation and recovery. There is a good side to the story as well. It's not all bad news. And we also know that around 50,000 Australians a year suffer their first ever stroke. And about 30 to 40% of those people will end up with aphasia, will actually lose their language, ability to speak, read and understand. Now, all of us have lost, all of us have been lost for words at some point, I'm sure. Yes? Um, through either shock, it could be a pleasant shock or a terrible shock. It could be, I'm sure you've been in conversations where you've been trying to convince something of something or explain something to someone where they just don't quite get it and you can't think of a different way to put it. You've tried all your linguistic tricks and all your linguistic resources in explaining something but the person still isn't getting it and you're lost for words for what else you can say. Um, loss of language and, and this kind of frustration we might feel when we're shocked or disappointed or nervous or excited is the kind of thing that people with aphasia encounter on a daily basis. It's not just a general annoyance, an occasional annoyance. It happens pretty much every day and most minutes of the day. This loss of language after stroke aphasia is the focus of the research of our speech pathology team here at ECU. And so I'm going to share with you today some of the current projects that we're working on that with the general aim of improving services for people with aphasia um, in Australia and internationally. But in order to understand what the loss of language might mean, I first of all want to talk a little bit about what language is. So, can you put up your hand if you engaged in one of these activities today? Okay, can you put up your hand if you engaged in two of them? How about all of them? Almost, okay. I thought there'd be a few more for all, but basically most people are using language all day, every day, in one form or another. Now, language is core to being human, and Noam Chomsky is a famous linguist that has written quite a bit about why language is a, a unique characteristic of humans that separates us from the animal world. We use language for many different purposes, to convince people, to argue, to complain, to defend ourselves, um, to maintain our relationships, which is probably the most central part to hum human beings. And we can exchange information to each other. Often people think language is about giving information to each other. But actually we use language to socialise quite a lot, even on a superficial level. So I don't know how many times today you said, hi, how are you, to someone. Now you're not actually asking them to give you a full rundown of their physical condition. Or if you say, what did you do on the weekend? You're not that interested probably to sit for two hours listening for everything that they did on the weekend. It's a way of bonding. So language isn't always about what you say. It's about a mechanism for getting close to people and social bonding. Language is complex. It can be about concrete information exchange, um, but it also can be used for, to amuse people, to to say funny things. We can also be sarcastic and ironic. So we can say something that isn't actually what we mean to say. So it could be pouring rain outside and I might say to someone, what a beautiful day this is. But that person will get what I'm saying. It's not actually contained in the words. It's the opposite of what I'm saying. This was something that a colleague came up with this week that I thought might be good to put in to show how flexible language is and how, how language can be used for humour and it's, it's very funny and it's flexible and we can do lots of things with language. Now because you're here tonight, I, I assume you've got some interest in language, even if you might not be sure, um, you know, exactly that you want to study linguistics. But today, possibly more than any other time in history, people are talking about language and communication. Many people are very worried about language at the moment. So they're very concerned that social media is actually killing our conversational skills, for example, or that children who text will never learn to spell, and that language and communication is somehow at threat in the world today. And that in this multilingual world, we're getting too much 
influence from other languages. So we get people complaining, that's, that's an Americanism, that's not an Australian English, that's not real English. I guess what I'm going to be saying today is that um, language is flexible. But I don't know if you're one of those people who get very angry about language, but a lot of people do. And when spelling changes and some of those things that we'll see coming up now, are you like this fellow on the side that gets really upset about this kind of thing? I know many academics in this room fit that bill, I can tell you from personal experience. And even myself, I really worry about apostrophes. <laughs> I don't lose sleep over it, I can tell you, but, but I do get annoyed by it. But some people get really angry. And I've had people from the media ring about changes in language and um, what's going to happen to the next generation. You know, it's going to kind of be a disaster. Um, but language is flexible. Language has changed over the years. It's dynamic and that's one of its magic characteristics. And, you know, we only have to go back to Shakespearean English. All the spelling was different. The writing was different. The grammar was different and the vocabulary was different. Language has moved. Language isn't something static. And the way you speak the language is not necessarily the way everyone speaks the language. There's a whole variety. So, what is language? Language, basically, the basic structure of language, we've got sounds that we, we actually have to speak, we've got words, we've got sentences, and then we've got whole chunks of language together, like this lecture, like reading a book, like listening to a news bulletin, and we've got written language and spoken language. Now, spoken language is actually the natural language. Written language is, is they're both rule governed, but written language is an artificial invention of, of human beings, whereas we're innately born with the ability to speak and use language orally. So if anyone's thinking of after this lecture already, and I hope you're not, <laughs> but if you are thinking of the reception and, and possibly having a drink afterwards or a soft drink or a glass of wine or whatever, I'm just going to run through what happens if you, when you get out of here this afternoon, you have to ask for a drink. And this happens within the brain. This is just a model of language, but you've got to have the intention. So that's somewhere around the frontal lobe. And when I talk about the brain, I don't want to be too simplistic because we used to think that there were different centres across the brain for different functions. And there certainly are to some extent, but current neuroscience tells us that it the function of many complex human functions are distributed all over the brain. So it's not as simple as we once thought at all. So we have the intention to speak, then we kind of start thinking about what we'd like to have to drink, and we think of some of those things, and we look into our dictionary, which is kind of in our brain, a, an analogy is a dictionary or a set of filing cabinets, and we pick out words that match the kinds of things we're thinking of. And people say, well, I thought words were the meanings. But if you think of the number of times when you know someone and you can visualise the person and you, you know all about them but you can't find the name, that's this level of processing where you have to pick out the word from your whole lexicon of words, pick out what's right for the sentence or the context that you want to speak and then you've got to find grammar to put the words in the right order because you'll sound really strange if you just put words willy-nilly and, excuse the pun, and um, uh, in the wrong order. So then you have to find the sounds to go with the words. Then you have to get a motor plan, a motor programming in, in the frontal area of your brain that, gets, that kicks in your actual mechanism. So your voice box, your lips, your tongue, your soft palate, to work out how to make those sounds. So there's a whole chain of processing that happens for you to actually produce this sentence, can I have a glass of wine? And that's the simple version. So there's lots of other things that the brain has to do. They have to work out when is it appropriate for me to ask for this? Who is it appropriate to ask it of? And is this the right kind of language that I'll use? So if I'm in a formal meeting, I'll use different kinds of language than I would if I'm sitting at home um, with a friend. You'll use different language and different types of grammar. So the brain is a very complex mechanism and the linguistic system is a complex system. As I've already mentioned, the disorder that we're talking about, sorry, here is aphasia. Um, and it mainly happens after stroke, but can happen after other 
injuries like the trauma injuries or brain tumours or infective processes. So aphasia is a difficulty and if you th in language. So if you think of learning a language, when you learn a language, you don't only learn to speak it, you learn to understand it, you learn to read it, and you learn to write it. So language has different modalities, even signing and gesture um, is part of language. So if you happen to have a hearing impairment from birth where you use sign language, if you have a stroke or a brain injury, you're going to lose that sign language in the same way that you would lose oral language. So I've got some videos here of people with aphasia to give you an idea if people haven't known anyone with aphasia, what this looks like. And the first man is fairly severely affected. And I have to go over and do this with the computer. Hi, Bob. Um, how did you get here today? Yeah. <sighs> Did, did, did you drive here today? No, no. No, you didn't drive? Um, um, no. Did, did you come here by train? No. By train? Aye, and... You, you drove? No. Bus? No. No. Um, Something to do with a car, yes, though. Yes. Um, oh, taxi. No bad. You came by a taxi. Yes. Right. No bad. Okay. Okay. Where did you come from? Yeah. You live in Edinburgh. No, no, oh, no, you don't. no, no, you don't. no, no, okay. no, no, no. Okay. No. Whereabouts have you come from then? Where we stay? We stay. Wish, wish day. Uh, bad, what? bad. <laughs> wish or? No, 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 no. 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 Um, wish day. No, 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 no. No. I'm not getting this right. <sighs> bad, bad. Okay. That man is severely affected, as you can see, but you can see he's also retained. He's an intelligent man. He knows what he wants to say. He just actually can't physically get the words and, and um, retrieve the words. Aphasia is not an all or nothing disorder. You can also have a very mild aphasia. Um, but this next lady is not as severe as the man, but still has significant issues. So tell me again, <laughs> well, tell me how that stroke has affected your communication. Oh, it's a terrible, terrible. It's a, I can't imagine it's a terrible. Is it a cut of my tongue and is it brain is is it is it terrible because is a is a is a hospital and is no nothing to a your cup of tea and no good and it is a breakfast uh, I don't know what is breakfast, mm -hmm. and I can't. It's terrible. Afraid, yes. afraid me. Yeah. It's terrible, mm -hmm. and is a is a. I can't phone and communicate, and is a is a family is a bubble in. And is it, is it reading and is lots of action, but for me mm. it's bang. Yes. And is terrible. Is a family. Is a oh, terrible. Mm. Terrible. Okay, there's another, just one more I want to play of someone in a more structured situation, of a testing situation where he's being asked to tell me the name of, tell the person, the unnamed person, the name of things. All right, now I want you to have a look at these objects, these pictures, and tell me the name of each one as I point to it. What's this one? It goes on your hand. Mm-hmm. Um, um,
All right, we'll leave that yeah. one, John. What about this one? It goes in drawers, uh, indoors. Mm -hmm. Or... Do you think what it's called? I know it, but I can't think of it. Okay, what about this one? A st stool, or... A chair. Good. This one? Yeah. Um, I know what they are. You cut your fingers on them. Mm -hmm. um, okay, what about this one? Find them off, off some birds. That's right. Um, so he knows what they are. He knows what the objects, no, pictures are, but he can't retrieve the names. You use them to lay on. Yeah. Sometimes, like all of us, you can eventually get it, but for him it was particularly difficult. But if you go back to the model that I had of the glass of wine, his difficulty is at the words and grammar retrieval level. It's not at the mouth, it's not higher up in his intention or his intellect, it's actually finding the right words, even though he's very aware intellectually of what, um, what he should be saying there. As I said, the aphasia can result from any of these kinds of injuries. Um, and when aphasia results, it means the speech centres, the main speech centres that I said are there, um, as well as numerous other centres can be affected. But this is an MRI scan. Um, it's actually the left side of the brain that's affected. The white area is the area where the damage is. Um, it's just around the, the other way on this slide. Um, and what happens is, after brain injury, there is actual cell death. So... Um, those areas of the brain are affected and the functions in those areas will be temporarily lost. Now compared to other stroke survivors who don't have aphasia, people with aphasia don't come off too well in many aspects, in many respects. They are more likely to get depression, they're more likely to be socially isolated and emotionally isolated and that's not surprising when we think how core language is to the way we function and to our own identity and to the way we relate to other people. Um, there's also people with aphasia have a longer length of stay in hospital. They, um, the severity of the aphasia is also in many people related directly to things like depression and quality of life. So aphasia is a very significant disability. A lot of people think strokes and physical disabilities. And often it's called an invisible disability because you can't see it. People with aphasia don't always have um, paralysis like other stroke survivors. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. But sometimes if they don't, they find it harder because people doesn't, don't know what's wrong with them. So that's kind of an interesting phenomenon about language as well. But as well as the person with aphasia, the carers and the people, their families and friends are affected as well. Carers of people with aphasia have high degrees of depression, higher le levels of stress, and people with aphasia and their families consume a greater proportion of healthcare resources. Because people with aphasia often don't go back to work and their, their life is often severely disrupted and they say they're not the same person after the stroke. But it's not all bad news. You would have heard of neuroplasticity and neuroplasticity, well, many of you would have. This, it's, the word has been in kind of the media the last 10 years, um, at least, for talking about the brain organising itself and growing neurons, which we didn't think it used to do after injuries like this. Um, the brain, neuroplasticity, as it says there, is the brain's ability to reorganise itself and to grow new neuronal connections throughout life. Until recently, we thought that brain damage was, uh, that there was, that new neurons only grew up you know, till the end of childhood. But now we know that the neurons keep on growing and activity can stimulate the growth of neurons. And 
things like learning a new language, learning new skills. We're always hopefully learning new skills throughout our lives. And what the brain does, it doesn't just sit there with the same functions and the same circuits. It's actually changing constantly as well and adapting to your life and what you're doing. So you can change your brain and the brain can affect you obviously, but you can also, I mean, you are your brain, let's face it. But, um, you know, the, the connection between what you do in your life and what happens physically in the brain, it's fascinating now what neuroscience is is telling us. So far from being without hope, people with, that, with brain injury um, should expect at least some recovery. So not always back to normal, but the brain is actively um, reorganising itself. And after actual injury, as opposed to just learning normal kinds of new skills, after injury it goes into overdrive to actually repair itself. So what you've got happening is your brain really trying to uh, repair itself, to reorganise the functions and with rehabilitation, so there's some degree of that happens normally with recovery but rehabilitation capitalises on that and we know there's a window, it, it seems like there's a window of opportunity for this to happen and it's very early after the brain damage. So rehabilitation is based on principles of neuroplasticity, that we're building on these natural recovery processes, we're building new neural pathways, and we do it through lots of repetition of the same kinds of activities, some new activities, but most importantly, meaningful activities. So a long time, for a long time we used to drill people on fairly boring things. Now we know that salience and meaningfulness of the activities that people are doing are central to the success of the rehabilitation. And the recent report in the Cochrane database that related to aphasia therapy, a speech pathology and speech therapy, um, suggests that, that um, for meaningful rehabilitation, that, that rehabilitation will actually affect everyday functioning. And so there's good evidence now that therapy, as long as it's meaningful and as long as it's sufficiently intensive um, and occurs at the right time, um, is going to at least get some improvement. So what does aphasia therapy look like? There are lots of different ways to help people with speech problems after stroke. One of the things, this looks the most traditional one, where you go into an office with a speech pathologist and you sit down with cards and pictures and practice sentences and words and names of things. And you can do that on a group level as well, which brings in more normal social interactions and conversation. But most recently, we've got some, with technolo technological advances, you now don't even need a real therapist. You can have an avatar being your therapist. Why would you want an avatar as your therapist? Um, I had grave misgivings about this when I found out about this because to me language and interaction should be between two human beings. However, um, avatars and computer technology can be extremely helpful for people practicing on their own. So when they go outside of treatment, they've got things to do. When, if you live in a rural or remote community where there's no access to rehabilitation, you can still access computer services. and well, hopefully, <laughs> and um, avatars are one way of doing that. Telehealth's another one where you can actually get in touch with therapists in the long distance. For some people, speech doesn't come back or they have ongoing issues with severe language impairment and we look at alternative devices. So these are computerised as well. So we might, we might be working with the person to get around the aphasia rather than improve the aphasia in the language itself. And also, as I said, families and carers are affected. So they're not left out of the equation with rehabilitation. And rehab and therapy involves them as well. All of those therapies are affected by different things. And what our team at ECU is looking at are two aspects. One is the importance of the timing of intervention. Now, it looks like, as I said, that evidence is suggesting that early intervention may be the best time. So that as soon after your brain injury, happens, that's the time to start the therapy, but the, the evidence is still to be gathered in what exactly is the best window of time and how long that lasts for. And the other one, to make therapy accessible and successful and meaningful and salient to you, you need to know the cultural, something about the cultural context of the people that you're working with. So I'll start off with the timing issue, and this is a large study that the team is undertaking at the moment called VERSE, which is very early rehabilitation in speech. 
it's an RCT where we're looking at introducing early therapy right after the stroke in the first two weeks, early speech therapy to people with aphasia on the neuroplasticity principles of earlier is better and the old use it or lose it principle, which is a great one to remember. And currently, if you, while this changes, while this is sort of inconsistent across the country and across hospitals and, and um, to some extent, from some work we've really, we've done in recent years that Erin Gadecki has led looking at um, when is the best time and how much treatment people get now. If you had a stroke at this minute, you may receive 14 minutes of speech therapy a week. That's because of health system constraints and a whole lot of other things, but that's probably what you get. You're getting 14 minutes a week in this very important window of neural recovery. So that's something that we're investigating through VERSE. And what we're doing is a national study. It's led through ECU um, with more than 15 sites across Australia. And we're looking at introducing, as I said, daily early speech therapy in the first two weeks after the stroke. It's the one of the largest in our field, uh, or the largest to date, and it's one of the first that's that's encompassing a cost-effectiveness model in it as well. So that's very important in today's world, that cost evaluation is part of any treatment. Um, so we're very excited about this. We're more than halfway with this. Um, and it's going to be a significant study and to see, to add to the literature, the important literature of when the timing is most effective. We've got another study that PhD student is, is involved with through Hollywood Hospital. Again, this is kind of depressing, but this is what your ward environment would be most likely to look like straight after your stroke. We know that stroke patients from our own work and from others' work spend more than half their day alone and inactive. And this is not good for people's talking. <laughs> So if the speech areas your brain needs stimulating and you're lying around half the day not talking to anybody, it's not, again, it's a wasted opportunity. For most stroke survivors, the therapy is the most exciting part of the day. That's the most activity they get. Um, nurses are very constrained, time pressures, number of people in hospitals. They certainly have some interaction, but a lot of it falls to family. And as we know, a lot of families work most of the day these days. When I started working, we'd talk to families. Now you're lucky if you see a family from nine to five. So people are left alone. And again, it's this window of opportunity. So what this project is about is enriching the environment. So there've been some animal studies, rat studies, where they enrich the environment of, of rats with strokes. So the rat may have a hemiplegia, which means they can't use one side of the body. They've made the environment enriched so that they have to move. So this is, is the exercise and physical side of rehabilitation. They put barriers to food so that the rats have to jump over things. They put a little exercise wheel in for them to run around. And the rats with, um, who had the enriched environment rather than just the, the bare bones of a, a um, box that they're sitting in, made a better recovery in terms of their hemiplegia um, improving. What we're doing is the first time anyone's done it from a communication point of view. Can't obviously do that on rat studies, so you really need people. <laughs> so what we're doing there is enriching the hospital environment. So we're trying to get patients together so there's more opportunity for conversations during the day. We're, try we're training staff and relatives in better ways to communicate with the person who has difficulty talking. We're making sure there are iPads, magazines, talking books around so that there are things for people to do even on their own that are language stimulation. And the aim of that is to see whether a kind of enriched environment like that will have a positive outcome on the speech recovery. The other major area that we're looking at in our program of research here at ECU is the context of Aboriginal Australians and brain injury. And this area um, was motivated by a number of reasons, but Aboriginal people, brain injury in Aboriginal populations occurs up to three times more often. It occurs at a younger age and more likely to result in death and disability at discharge. 
by discharge time. But the main reason for motivation for these pro this project was that few Aboriginal people are receiving rehabilitation, any rehabilitation after discharge from hospital. Little written in the research literature, virtually nothing in our field of communication disorders, nothing much written in the general field of rehabilitation. And one of our collaborators, Judy Katzen-Ellenbogen from UWA, is an epidemiologist and her study in 2010 was one of the first to actually, if not the first, to extract Aboriginal data from other stroke data. So 2010, if you can imagine, that was the first time Aboriginal issues had been even mentioned in this, in this um, area. When we talk about Aboriginal Australians, we're obviously talking about a very diverse group of people, and I always highlight this in any, any talks. We're not talking about one group, we're talking about um, a group of people where there's 145 separate languages still in existence, still talking active languages, and people come from very different areas and different language groups and cultural groups. So that has its own implications for determining context of, of treatment. Our project is called Missing Voices. Uh, it's about to finish at the end of the month and we're looking for more funding through a larger project where we're looking at implementing the findings of this study. One of the issues in Aboriginal research is that Aboriginal populations have been researched to death in Australia and a lot of Aboriginal communities are very concerned that the researchers come in and out and they never see them again. So a lot of work goes into the initial project but very little into what happens next what does the community benefit from it. So that's our next challenge, is to make sure that happens and that the things that we've found from all the people we've spoken to um, really comes to some kind of fruition. Part of the project was capacity building in communities, employing Aboriginal people throughout WA. This was a statewide study and we talked to Aboriginal people with communication disorders and their families. First time um, that it happened across WA and also we talked to Aboriginal health workers, GPs, speech pathologists um, and aged care facilities about the services that existed and the issues that were currently um, arising. And um, <clears throat> this, the other thing I'll say about this too, the, it's uh, a combined team of Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal researchers which is crucial to Aboriginal research that it's driven by Aboriginal community as well and that there's an investment in what happens next and that's been a crucial part of it. We've got over 100 stories of a variety of people, about 35, <coughs> excuse me, stories of people with communication problems um, and we're, which we're still collating all the data from that. We've also developed the first screening tool for communication disorders in Aboriginal populations and I'm happy to say it's been translated into <coughs> Nyungamata, excuse me if any Nyungamata speakers, but um, it's a Pilbara language and it's the first time one in our field and across a lot of fields that uh, a screening tool, a tool, an assessment tool has actually been translated into an Aboriginal language and that's a whole other talk I could give on that exercise which was a very interesting one. I can't go into the data now because there's really too much but just have a read of this quote. Um, a lot of the emphasis of the speakers that we spoke to um, was on the cultural difference between the largely non-Aboriginal health system um, health providers and Aboriginal people. The cultural differences, the linguistic differences, and with 145 languages, as I can tell, also tell you that the, the interpreter services throughout Australia are extremely limited. And if you're Aboriginal and you don't speak English and you're aphasic, it's going to be very difficult for you finding someone who speaks your language if you've come from remote WA to Perth, which most of the stroke patients and the brain injury patients do. So there's a real mismatch and we've got a lot of information on and recommendations as to ways to make that a little bit easier. Remembering also that it's not, also, it's not only about making something more comfortable and safe for people, which is totally, you know, a first priority, but it's also about efficacy of the treatment that you can offer. So if someone isn't safe, it doesn't feel safe, no one speaks the language, no one knows the culture, you're in a very um, foreign environment, the chances are that your rehabilitation isn't going to work anyway, unless something's changed in the system. 
that's about it. So I just hope I've given you a, a kind of a run through of the kinds of issues that pay, face people with aphasia, the issues that we're dealing with in our research, what we're trying to do, some of the challenges. Um, and I hope you get a feeling for what rehabilitation and speech loss is like for people who have really lost their words. Thank you.